Yes, that's it. Uh, you know, we, have, we will see you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are happy here tonight at the Fulun Khalshima Foundation uh, to deliver this beautiful lecture from Professor Martha Joukowsky. Uh, Martha Joukowsky, she's a professor at Brown University, uh, Department of Antiquity. She's the director at the Brown University Center for Old World Archaeology and Art, and director of the Brown University Petra Great Temple Excavation. The title of tonight's lecture will be The Art of Nabatean Architecture, Petra Great Temple, 10 Years of Brown University Excavation. I think it's the most appropriate place to have this lecture in this temple in this Roman temple that for the first time in the history of Jordan a private foundation with the cooperation of the Department of Antiquities does the excavation uh, with the help of ECO of Sir Pierre Petrae and uh, this unique set uh, will be the place for your lecture thank you Martha for coming and thank you for uh, coming tonight and please welcome Professor Martha This is a very emotional time for all of us, particularly those who know and love uh, the Shaman family. And as you know, there's been a loss, another loss. I would really appreciate it if all of you would stand for a moment of silence on behalf of the family with all our good wishes and full hearts. Thank you. It is a joy for me to be here. It is a joy to talk about Petra. Uh, many of you work with me. Many of you encourage me. Uh, I thank all of you. I thank the Department of Antiquities, uh, our esteemed director. I thank the people of Petra, my Bedouin workmen who have been with me for 10 years who have brought this site alive. I thank, from the bottom of my heart, my team, one of whom is here, Steve Larson, who just left the field with me yesterday. He has a Bekai Fellowship uh, to study uh, for his dissertation at ACOR. So those of us who are in the field, who are working away, 
are really engaged in something that is so exciting, so enthralling, and yet we can't do it without your excitement and your interest and the interest you bring to us by visiting us. Whether or not it's uh, Ali Jabri, who always seems to find three or four days uh, to come and, and work with us or observe what we're doing. Jane Taylor, who was me measuring steps with me last week, uh, and I miss her very much in the field. It's all of you who take what we're doing and help it reach a broader public. It's the school children who walk through the site to whom we're bringing the legacy of this wonderful country alive. And we feel a tremendous responsibility and a tremendous love and respect for the people of Jordan and for, of course, our beloved Nabataeans. As soon as it becomes a little bit darker, I'm going to show you slides of our 10 years of work. Our 10 years of work have involved numerous experts, whether or not it be in numismatics or the study of coins or ground penetrating radar, the use of new techniques uh, to study archaeological sites. We have two graduate engineers who are working with us now uh, who will hopefully bring uh, virtual reality to every school child uh, in Jordan and throughout the world. These are the tools that can be used to transmit ideas in an easy and inexpensive way. And there's no reason why a person should have to come and visit a site when they can really walk through a virtual site any virtual site, be it Petra or Pompeii or whatever. Our heritage means so much to us, and our heritage means that we're taking it to our children and we're saying, this is important, this is an integral part of your education, and it is part of your heritage. You are heirs to all of this wonderful discovery that's going on. I wrote an article for ADASH last year entitled, The Petrograde Temple Offers More Surprises. I don't know how to entitle the article this year because the Petrograde Temple every day offers more and more surprises. Uli uh, Baywald, who is here, came out of the field, came up to uh, the lecture tonight, uh, has told me of his surprising work at the site today. Now, many of you have uh, visited the site and have seen the remarkable plaster remains that we have found. And uh, these plaster remains, unfortunately, you won't see tonight. You will see them at the ACOR lecture. I don't have pictures that could be developed in time. We are excavating a cave which is adjacent to this site which has all the remarkable finds. And the cave has produced beautiful whole Nabataean pots. Absolutely incredible, 10 buckets of Nabataean pottery a day. Now this is a tremendous responsibility for a team because each one of these Nabataean shirts has to be looked at, has to be studied, and somehow interpreted. In our database to date, we have over 275,000 pieces that we can use to study the site. In addition to this, we have an architectural fragment database, which is extensive, uh, including 9,000 pieces. About 500 pieces are those components for which we're known, and those are the elephant-headed capitals that are Asian in origin. These capitals give us pause to think about Nabatea's connections with the East. They give us pause to think about the sculptural tradition 
that was brought to Petra by those who wanted to make her city the grandest city and make her a center of the, the uh, certainly the Nabataean world. Where did these ideas come from? We have to look beyond what we now know that exists in Jordan about Nabataean sites. We have to go further east. We have to think about what is happening, not only in Saudi Arabia, because of course, Nadine Saleh is very much in, in attuned to Petra, but nothing like that exists in Nadine Saleh. I took my sabbatical in India, looking for elephant-headed capitals. I was sent first to the Vatican Museum, where there is an elephant-headed capital that's fashioned in porphyry. It bears no resemblance at all to the elephant-headed capitals that we have at the Great Temple. So we have a lot of questions. And even with all our students and with all our great minds, a lot of these questions about sculptural traditions, about ideas, about contact between peoples, it's not, they're not going to be answered in probably my lifetime. But if we excite students to begin to take a, a ownership of the sites and what they're producing, if we can take them to museums and thrill them by their coming to, to Petra, if we can engage them in the past, then we really have promise for the future. And this, to my way of thinking, is one of the most important jobs that I have in uh, not only publication, but also in excavation. It is a tremendous responsibility. One of my graduate students, Sarah Carsbury, began to work with me about six years ago. She now has the responsibility of heading the excavation of the small temple. The small temple is not in a line uh, in the same alignment or on the same axis as the Great Temple. It lies to our west. Somehow there must have been some interrelationship in antiquity with the small temple. However, the small temple appears as if it was probably dedicated to an emperor cult. For Sarah has found over 3,500 fragments of marble cladding. And on these fragments are inscribed dedicatory messages from Roman emperors. Now this is terribly important for Petra because we have so few inscriptions. And some of these have been reused, but most of them are terribly important. And Trianos Gagnos, who, as you know, is translating the Petra Scrolls, uh, which will be an, uh, an ACOR new pu publication, has had a look at these inscriptions. And one of the most important inscriptions, he says, that has ever been found in Petra is an inscription that Steve found first day on the job. It was turned over. We had been using it as a step. He turned it over, and it probably is tragenic. Now, it is very important for us, who are specialists, to find out who came to Petra and when. And we don't know whether or not Trajan visited Petra. But he certainly wanted Petra as part of his empire and to be known in Petra. The latest inscription that Sarah has found is a massive inscription, which is probably dated to the 4th century CE or AD. <coughs> this gives us a full time range for the use of this precious little monument, which before our excavations, before she took the responsibility for excavating it, was not known. I have to remind visitors to Petra that only 5% of the city has been excavated. The work that has been undertaken by the American Center of Oriental Research, by various teams, <coughs> including the Swiss 
who are working at Essentour, the French who are working, thank you, folks, the French who are working at the Castro Bent, all of these are coordinated by Suleiman Fajat. All of these are coordinated by us. We <coughs> and by ACOR, or the American Center. We are all talking to one another. You are here in Amman. You don't hear these conversations. We are so excited by what we're doing and how we're doing it and enjoying each other's successes, problems, and sharing our ideas with one another. This is terribly important, and it's terribly important not only for Petra, but it's terribly important for archaeology as a whole. So whether or not it's a Neolithic site that's being excavated, or it's the Temple of the Winged Lions, or it's the Custerel Bent, or it is the ACOR project and Patricia Bekai's uh, Blue Chapel or whatever, everyone is talking. Everyone is using the expertise of each other's teams. Most of our workmen travel from team to team to team. And that's how they keep body and soul together. Because this is a very, very depressed area of the country. And these people have very little to, to live on. So it is important to them not only to work, but also to contribute. So I can take credit for having started something and continuing with a project that is of such enormity and such excitement for everybody involved. And those of you who carry the message beyond this wonderful courtyard, which was restored by Pierre Bacay, uh, is, is really, I'm, I'm asking you to take the responsibility for something that is really more important than any one of us or whatever. So I owe a tremendous amount of gratitude to the Department of Antiquities for their constant encouragement. Ten years of hard work working with people like Suleiman Farajat, who was my first inspector, all the people in Petra who are now working for the site as, as a whole, they share, everybody has pitched in, helped, shared ideas, and we continue to do so. So know that your heritage is in the hands of people who love it, who respect it, who wanted to be left in as complete a form as possible for you and your children and your children's children to enjoy. Are there any questions about these early comments? You, you may well you may, pardon me, you may well ask, what have you done to preserve and conserve the site for our children's children? A major part of our budget every year is spent on conservation. We have opened a site that is in danger of destroying itself. Sandstone, as you know, is very friable. It wants to revert to sand. And we have had to rebuild walls. And what we try to do is to make the public aware of what we have rebuilt and what we actually excavated by drawing lines on the restored blocks. But without this restoration, without our interest in preserving the, the uh, structure or the various structures, for future generations, it would all revert to uh, a, a pile of rubble. Uh, we've had to move a lot of blocks. Yes, I use bulldozers. I have to. Most of these columns are at least half a, a ton, if not a ton. We can't move them. We've expended too much of our of our Bedouin labor in moving. Uh, 
physically moving hand moving blocks we just can't do it and make any headway so if you do come to the to the site you will see back dirt that is being moved you will see a bulldozer that is moving elements uh, that are put into uh, what we call our lapidarium or graveyard for elements that can be reused in reconstruction and then we we have another pile of blocks that can be used as as uh, ashlars that are unfinished uh, that can be used by the department or anybody else for rebuilding there's a constant rebuilding in Petra because of the flash flags, etc. So again, this is uh, one of the problems that we hope that we, in perpetuity, have left a site that is accessible to tourists, accessible and not dangerous for children or for tourists, or for animals, by that matter. After our first year of excavation, we found a dead donkey in one of our pits and we realized that we had to fence off the whole site uh, we fenced off the whole site with a ribbon on the gate not a lock so that people could visit the site who are interested they could get in but it would keep animals out so there is still much to be done as far as restoration is concerned and i hope that i can show you as soon as it becomes dark the progress of these excavations. If anyone has any questions, I'd be only too happy to answer them. And if not, we can get to the slides. I don't want to hold you any any longer. We have students in the audience. You can the ask them to answer. Turn these lights off. How much more have you got left? About? How much more do I have left? Yeah. You know, I thought that we would be finishing uh, next year or the year after. This year, I wanted to find what I called a shrine room. I wanted to find the other corner of the room. Of course, there was a threshold from that room into an adjacent room. And in the adjacent room, we found the, the, the most exquisite plaster that has ever been found anywhere outside of Rome. Yes. And this is what Willie Baywald, who is experienced in plaster and handling this plaster, is doing now to restore it. And Willie told me, and please do not repeat this, <laughs> Willie told me tonight that underneath this top level, there is a level that is prepared with a lot of gold leaf. So this will be level, there are, there are to my way of thinking, at least five levels that are there. So we will see. Now, uh, we, have, we have used the expertise of our visitors and um, as most of you know, uh, Prince Basil uh, attended Brown University and he came with his children two weeks ago. And the remarkable aspect of this plaster is that it has fallen face up. So the design is there. As we excavated down, we began to see tendrils, columns, uh, flowers, whatever but it was face up. We assumed, probably incorrectly, that it was on a ceiling and that there had been an earthquake and the torque had flipped it over so that it was face up. Prince Basil looked at this and he said, you know, I think what you have here is a workshop. And I think what you had were ceilings and plaster decoration that was in preparation to put in the temple or perhaps in some other building, etc. And I think that that's a very good explanation. After all, he's an engineer. He should know about torque and how things turn. And to see this so perfectly, yes, there is a slight slope, but to see the walls that are extant for at least two meters in height 
And to think of that ceiling flipping over, I think that his explanation is probably the best explanation. So what we may have, which is something that we've never had before, is a workshop. Next to this workshop is a cistern, which we have not excavated. And next to the cistern are these two caves, which have produced incredible amounts of beautiful Nabataean pottery. Beautiful, absolutely amazing wares. Painted, unpainted, roulette, paper thin, really palace type wares. How they were established there, we don't know. Maybe there was a workshop that we have yet to find that was nearby. But the source of the water, because you know that the lime slaking process requires a tremendous amount of water. So the bringing of the lime, the fashioning of the lime, it's being produced in the workshop, shows us, gives us an idea about how, uh, what, what process was undertaken by these people. Trade routes, I ask everybody to look beyond uh, the usual Nabataean horizons, uh, particularly because of the elephants. Next, please. Here is the recent map that was published in the Bulletin of the Oriental Research. Uh, uh, undertaken, this is a map that was done again in conjunction with the American School of Oriental Research and the Hashemite University. And those of you who are interested in technology know that the Hashemite University is having a conference, I think beginning on August 11th, and we will be talking about different technologies that have been in use at Petra. But here we have the uh, Central Street, and we have the market, uh, the shops which were excavated by uh, the American Center, the Paradisios, which was uh, excavated uh, in part by Leah Vidal, who was one of my former students, uh, the Great Temple, uh, the Temenos Gate, and Jay Taylor and I were measuring steps about uh, four meters from the Temenos Gate. The, the so-called bath complex, which I think might be, have been a palatial complex, and then of course the casserole bed, and the new excavations that have been undertaken by the, the French. And up here we have of course the church projects, uh, the Petra Church, the Blue Chapel excavated by Patricia Picard, and the Ridge Church also excavated by Patricia. Now this map has been again a collaborative project and I can't stress enough the fact that all of us, or at least most of us, after we finish our surveying, give all our data collection results to the Hashemite University. So the, a composite of the central city, which had never been mapped before, and had never been mapped as accurately as this, had been mapped, but never as accurately as this can be realized. <coughs> Next, please. Here's Jane Taylor's photograph of the wonderful tombs, the colonnaded street, the juniper tree. This is what Petra looked like when we first started to excavate 10 years ago. Next, please. And here is an aerial photograph <coughs> taken by Will and Ellie Myers in 1992. And what you're looking at is the Casero Vent the street, the remains of the temple, temple of the winged lions, and nothing else. Think of what has happened in 10 years. You are to be congratulated. Next. 1994, <laughs> our excavations, we wanted to know the lateral extent of the Great Temple, 
Here are the steps. Next. 1995, as you can see, no excedra have been found. We have one set of columns coming down on the east, have made a couple of, of deep trenches in the back, discovered that we have a walkway on the west. Next. 1996, we uncovered the uh, west excedra. We find the hexagonal pavement. We have the triple colonnade uh, that we've discovered. Not a double colonnade, but a triple colonnade. Next. 1997, the East Etc. has been uncovered. The area of the, the canalization has been discovered. The lateral stairways have just begun to be excavated. The west walkway has been excavated, and as you can see, there is nothing much that has happened in the east at all. Next. 1998, uh, a little bit more, particularly in the west, the west corridor with its frescoes has been uh, uncovered. Another trench has been put into this area to discover what lay below to see whether or not it was similar to what was going on in the east. And in the east, we had cross walls that stymied us. And the cross walls uh, contained a fill of second century wares. So we knew that sometime, second century CE, we knew that sometime in the Roman period, this, whatever was below here, had ceased to function and it had been filled in whereas this seemed to be fairly clear on this side. Next, please. Here we are in 1998. You can see we have greater definition of the plaza. We still haven't excavated this tremendous bulk of earth. We've come up to the East Plaza. We found that it is on bedrock. We think we have a double wall up here in the east. And we have defined the west walkway by this time. We've restored, not restored, but put more column drums up. We've made a sondage here, <coughs> which has shown us that the temple or that the structure was built up in the first century BCE and that it is, in fact, Nabataean. Now, look at the size of this area. This is over 5,700 and some odd square meters. Here are three people that are standing <laughs> in the middle of it. Think of the human effort that this has taken. And we have begun to work in the propyleum. And if you come to the ACOR lecture, you will see that this has been completely cleared now, both the north of it, the north side and the south side. Next, please. Here we are in 1999, and I want to bring your attention to one thing that may be a crazy theory on my part. It's been argued that this is an administrative building. It is not a temple at all. And I argue for the fact that temples uh, and administration certainly had ritual involved. And I want to point out one thing, and that is not the theater that by this time had been completely excavated in the center of the structure. And of course, the theater goes back to the rear and seats about 620 people. Well, as you well know, the main theater at Petra is said to seat somewhere between 4,000 and 7,000 inhabitants. So this theater inside a temple is a novelty. There is nothing like it in the classical world. Uh, theaters are associated with temples, but they're outside them. Uh, and there is nothing that we can draw on, even from C or from Dura Europas. There is nothing that is quite like this structure. And there's one thing that I want to bring your attention to. In the early slide that I showed you of the site before excavation, this whole area served as farmer's fields. The column drums that we have 
replaced on top of the columns here, were used to divide one field from the other. We have scar marks on the hexagonal papers from the plow. But I want to point out something that I, it's taken me 10 years of looking at aerial photographs like this. I think we may have had an altar. And I think that altar, this is just too neat to be believed, was in this central portion and in direct alignment with the center of ritual at the temple. Now, I don't know if I'll be crazy enough to publish this. I think I put these things in a footnote. But of course, everything from this area had been removed uh, in, in, in Bedouin times. And uh, so it is a matter of conjecture. The theater has been fully exposed. By this time, it has been restored. Next, please. Here we are in 1999. You can see more work has been done on the etc. Uh, here are the, bath, the baths, which are, or the, as I call them, the palace and the Temenos Gate. Think of the importance of the most important building of any site is located near the gate. Now, that doesn't mean to take away any importance from the Qasr and, and Fauzi Zayedin always has a fit when I call this the Great Temple because he believes the Great Temple is the Qasr event. Well, of course, the Great Temple is the Qasr event. However, what speaks for this structure is that it is considerably larger and the precinct is uh, uh, in an organized fashion. Uh, here we have, and maybe the French will find that the Qasr also has colonnades as we do here. Next, please. So here we have a plan. Uh, we use a total station. Uh, we have the steps, the lower terminals, triple colonnades on the east and the west, ending in Exed Drive, steps going up to the forecourt, the pronouns of the of the of the uh, the, the uh, tetrastyle and antis, uh, 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 entry into the temple. An entry originally, and what I've done is take away the stage building, which was built later this year, half of it, so that people can enter into the theatron. And my contention is that originally the stage building was not there, and that the audience could view what was going on in the lower terminals, and those in the lower terminals could take part in the ritual or the uh, whatever was being enacted in the center of the temple. Next, please. Starting with the Propylaea steps, as I mentioned before, they are late. Um, while Jane and I were excavating last week, uh, I found a cache that had never been excavated on the sidewalk, and it is Nabataean. It is definitely first century AD, uh, and this, this whole sidewalk of uh, curbing that separates the sidewalk from the street, I don't think has ever been excavated. Next, please. As we come into the Propylaea, going toward the east from the west, there are beetles. These are anaconic sacred stones. You know that the Nabataeans worship not only the stone, uh, but also anthropomorphic representations of their gods. Unfortunately, there are no uh, inscriptions. Is this Alusa and Dushara, or uh, are they both representations of Dushara? We just don't know. But this, again, is the prelude to the whole precinct. This is the Propylaea. This is one of the access uh, points to the temple and here we have a small altar with an inch um, with these god blocks. Next, please. And we also have in the finds here a wonderful small sculpture of an athlete who is uh, uh, probably running. Next. And here we have uh, what the site looked like at the end of the 2001 
uh, excavations. We have a cryptoporticus here, which is five meters below the uh, colonnade, which lies on top of it. Uh, you can see that a lot more work has been done on the propylaea by the end of last season. Uh, two trenches are, are also in the east propylaea. This is being excavated uh, right now as we speak. Here is the small temple that I mentioned to you before, where Steve has just spent five weeks working, which has all these wonderful inscriptions. And uh, this was taken at the end of last season. You can't really tell too well, but the orientation is uh, unlike the orientation of the uh, Great Temple. Next. Here's the Cryptoporticus. Uh, arch structures uh, which lie underneath the triple colonnade. Next. And then on top of the tri triple colonnade, these wonderful elephant headed capitals. Uh, one of which I found an elephant head yesterday. Absolutely incredible. A number of Indian archaeologists have been visiting us. Uh, and they were terribly excited. No, none of them had seen anything like this in India. But notice the egg and tongue, uh, the egg and the tongue here. This is a typical Hellenistic device that is used. Uh, but the Nabataean or Alexandrian sculptor who worked on these columns uh, had this concept of working the elephant head uh, into the architectural and decorative scheme. Next. Reconstruction. Next. This is the one of the pieces that just came back from, from Finland. This elephant looks very Pacific. This one looks very angry. How these were placed, this happens to be part of an engaged column. This, we transported these down to the museum, uh, Petra Museum, and they're now in the entry. Next. And we've restored the columns, uh, some of the columns, and put uh, bruised uh, uh, capitals on top of them, so again, that the observer who comes to visit the temple will understand that the, the uh, lower Temenos has a different architectural program than does the temple itself. Next. Underground water canalization systems. I have a, a, a student, an undergraduate, who's fascinated by this. I think all of us are fascinated by water if we live and work in Jordan, uh, particularly in the Petra area. Uh, well, the Ewald, of, co of course, has been instrumental in restoring the seek and uh, seeing whether or not his water systems work. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could restore one of our reservoirs at the site? Because in order to perform restoration, we have to transport water to the site at some, I must say, uh, cost. Next. This goes right under the uh, central part of the site here is uh, ground penetrating radar, Terry Tallis of uh, Brown University's geology department. Next. And this was in 1995, and you could see the hyperbolic type of readout that we would get, so we knew exactly where the tunnels were. Next. And we can graph where the tunnels could be seen and then where they were interrupted. Next. Then we worked on a flow pattern because we have a number of walls, that later walls, that, that constrain the flow to the temple. As a matter of fact, all the doorways to the temple around the corridor were at one time closed up. And my husband, um, Ernest Joukowsky, posited that perhaps the temple at one time had served as a fort. Uh, why close all these doorways? Was it really to constrain crowds or whatever? And we have what looks like some sort of a gun emplacement in the doorway in the back. Not the really gun, but uh, some sort of a slit. Iced uh, bread to remind people that this is the devastation that earthquakes can uh, bring about. Next. And this is what we found. 
And this is why we needed to use heavy equipment. Each one of these drums had to be measured, numbered, and then restored. And you have to remember that these drums look pretty awkward to you. But in antiquity, they were all covered with plaster. They were co covered with red plaster, with, with yellow plaster, and with a fluting on top in white. And that, in combination with the glorious capitals that once graced the uh, temple itself, must have had a, a tremendous impact of power uh, on on the uh, whoever whoever viewed the temple. Next, the plaster that we found in situ. You can see the cassettes raised plaster with, with blues, and uh, Willie Baywolf has restored most of these. This happens to be in the west corner. Next. And here is his restoration of the uh, red and yellow banded plaster. And of course, many of the elements of the capitals, which are Nabataean type A capitals, have gold leaf affixed to them. Next. The theater, which is has been restored as you see it here, only five uh, rows are extant. Next, and this tree, this juniper tree, has been in a crisis because it ex its roots extended over the top of this wall. This escarpment now is 12 meters in height. We used to eat lunch underneath this tree mm -hmm. 10 years ago. We'd be hard pressed to do so today. Mm -hmm. Next. In the east of the temple, we had a tremendous surprise. We have a rock cut room. Mm -hmm. We have another room here. This is a double wall um, leading to the east. Next. And here is the interior of the double wall room with a trough. So it was later used, and a wonderful cache of Nabatee and pottery was found here. This year we discovered rock cut steps that went up to that cave that you just saw on the last slide. Next. And wonderful Nabatee and wares. Beautiful Nabatee and wares. Next. Here is a very rare Nabataean piece. This is a pilgrim bottle. And I don't know if Patricia Bakai has a pilgrim bottle because she has an extensive uh, collection from her tombs. But this is the first one that I've seen uh, in Nabataean ware. Next. And then we found a sister. And this sister holds about 390,000 gallons of water. Uh, this is our first <laughs> hole going down into this room, which is about nine meters by nine meters by about six meters in depth. And it, it is, lies underneath, it is rock cut, and it lies underneath the east plaza of the temple. So it certainly would have served the needs of the people who use the temple. Next. Now this is the room of question in the back. Here's an antique room. You can see roof tiles in C2 on the floor. This is a threshold into this room where there was a niche, which I presumed was a douchara niche. We could not excavate this wall last year. So we have taken, we have gone through this wall and this is the room over here where this gorgeous plaster lies in C2. Uh, absolutely extraordinary. Now, who would ever have uh, expected this? So I can't answer C.D. Brad's question. We have so many surprises. There's so many new things that we find that it is hard to know. I plan to be here for uh, certainly to finish the project, but I might not be able to. And uh, I think our notes are good enough, and I think that I have a well-trained staff. Uh, so if the project had to be finished by somebody else, uh, I'm, I'm reminded by my workers that I'm an old lady. <laughs> I'm old enough to be their grandmother. I mean, you know, there's nothing like uh, the, the truth. 
So at some point in time, I know that I'm going to have to, it's, it's hard work to be in the field day in and day out. Uh, so I'm going to have to turn this, this project over to someone, but I would hope that I'd be able to finish it uh, with, with the team that I have because uh, we know the site now so well and there's a tremendous amount of experience, uh, collective experience in working with it. So here we have this marvelous plaster deposit. And of course, the plaster deposit is uh, one of the special, spectacular finds of this season. Next, please. We have the, I call this sort of a contrition to Dushara. This is a sword. Uh, God, deity, I don't know, just maybe an emblem that is carved into the wall of the bedrock. Uh, don't forget, rock is precious to the Nabataeans. Um, you can see that there is uh, some natural fissure in the rock just uh, above this figure who is standing in or what looks to be an altar. Uh, this, of course, uh, would not have been seen in antiquity because the wall would have been built on top of it. Next, please. Here is the rear of the temple, and last year we found uh, mosaic, uh, excuse me, frescoes. You could see how all these walls, all these doorways, mm -hmm. had been blocked by walls. Mm -hmm. We had to take this east doorway out so that we could uh, access the area. Um, and remove the spoil. Next. And Emily Egan uh, proposes this scheme for the coloration. She excavated this area. Uh, this is part of her senior honors thesis for Brown University. Uh, and this is one of the programs and the colors that were found and that are found in our database. Next. And these cassettes. Next. Next. We have inscriptions. This happened to be an inscription, partial inscription that was found in one of the back rooms, uh, which has been dated to the Trajanic period by Steve Tracy. Next. Of course, we have coins. Um, uh, a number, most of the coins are Nabataean that we have, Dushara and he'll do, or uh, uh, one of his wives next. We have superlative sculpture. Here's a partial sculpture of a man's head, mm -hmm. the floral leaf, the raised uh, iris of the Nabataeans, a mustache. Fortunately, we never found the rest of it. Next. This is the sculptural program of the temple itself. The upper order, the lower order is bushy acanthus leaves. The upper order is hibiscus petals with uh, pine cones, whatever. Absolutely marvelously rich, very deeply drilled. These are artisans, and I think probably the same artisans that uh, sculpted the decoration of the Hasne. So the, I think we're, we're contemporary. Uh, with the Hasna. Next. Marvelous Nabataean plates. Next. And of course, lots of films. We've done our best. You know, all these people wanted so much of your time. They're a pain in the neck. But anyway, <laughs> Discovery Channel, whatever. And a lot of people have been attracted to to Petra and Jordan because those of us who are in the field are constantly asked uh, to, uh, you know, uh, help them make films. Next. And here is a solid team. My Bedouin workmen are not in this photograph. Um, this was a team picture of a couple of years ago. And all of my team members are faithful. Uh, they all want to continue studying whether or not it's the bones, so we understand more about the subsistence patterns that we have uh, exhibited at the temple. Uh, but most of these people are back and are, are with us. Next. 
And in, in the center of that last picture was Dahala Koblan, who is my uh, right and my left hand. He is a, my foreman. He is also the chief restorer at the site. Uh, here we are on the cover of the book, uh, talking about one of the columns uh, and the restoration of, of windows and whatever. Uh, we're always in discussion, as are all the members of the team, about the needs of the site and how we can best uh, uh, respect the remains and yet uh, excavate it. And so we have published the first five years of our report with a CD-ROM uh, for anyone who's interested in all the fine data, all the surveying data, etc. Next. And now our virtual reconstruction is underway. You can walk into a cave, which is an eight foot by eight foot room, and you can walk up the stairs and on the platform. You can take a seat in the theater. If you want to, you can jump to the top of the column, uh, whatever. It's, it's very exciting. And of course, it's conjecture. But the most important thing about this is that I can, or trenches can be imposed on this model and I can see exactly what my distribution of lamps is per level. So when I have Byzantine lamps on top and Nabataean lamps on the bottom, I know I have a reverse stratigraphy. Mm. But the only way I can prove it is by imposing the stratigraphy on this model, which I which I don't show you. I'll be showing that at the Hashemite University uh, conference. But it is the only way I can prove that I have reverse stratigraphy in some cases. Next. Again, another reconstruction of the temple. And one of our advisors, I must say, I, those of you who know Petra know the book The Architecture of Petra by Judith McKenzie. Judith comes and spends uh, at least a week with me every year talking about any sort of reconstruction that, that I'm not an architectural historian, and uh, she serves as the architectural historian uh, role of the, of the site and its reconstruction. Next. So here we are at the end of last season, uh, in front of the Temenos Gate. This area here that I posit might have been uh, some sort of an altar. The doorways on the east, which were filled in, here is the small temple, uh, and the remains of some of the ends uh, work. And uh, I want to thank all of you for your interest in supporting us and helping us in, in working with us and discussing these problems. Every time we take a site tour, there is something that comes up that is of interest. And it's your interest and your help in ideas that really excites us and keeps us going. So thank you very much for your attention and your interest tonight. And as long as the questions aren't embarrassing, I want to thank my husband for the photography. Uh, Artie Joukowsky has been my photographer since the beginning. And you can see that Russian soul coming through the, the photographs. And I may add that he has always turned to Jane Taylor for added advice. So again, it's a collaborative effort. Health of God, if you want to touch my foundation, I would like to thank Martha for this great night of lecture. For us, Jordanians, it's for, for me, it's for the first time I've seen it's such a beautiful process of excavation and finding beautiful evidence of our history and heritage. Thank you, Martha, for that. I thank you, Brown University, and Ecole, and all of you. Thank you for coming. Delight to have them 
actually see what I do in the field, because they see me very much as the very elegant professor. Not really. <laughs> Taking it down. <laughs> <laughs> That's we, have, we have your students and we have you all the time. And when you're taking, giving the thin bill over to the department, we will have the flag of Jordan and the flag of Prague together. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. We will, we, we will tell Sidi nice. Faisal that nice too. To say that. <laughs> oh, nice. That's my Arabic. Uh, I mean, after all these years. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. You won't want that flag. It's now in tatters. <laughs> this, this is. Uh, this should remind us all the time in the good work which you have conducted and the good work which is going to be conducted. By Beautiful lecture. Thank you. Great efforts you're giving. It's wonderful. Come and visit. Well, actually, every actually, day. Every day.